All right, so just want to just welcome everybody in person and online and uh, just, just appreciate the uh, feedback we, I got from the last teaching uh, on rejection last week. And we're just going to pick back up in that. There's, there's so much to it. In fact, once you really see your eyes are open to the way rejection works and the way people respond to rejection, you realize this entire world is basically one reaction to rejection. <laughs> Everything that's happened, basically, when you understand, really, it is. Uh, so much is just one big cosmic reaction to rejection because we were created by God to feel his love and experience his love and, and just give love. And when we don't have that, rejection produces an incredible amount of ugly, terrible fruit. And so this is... Um, Session 16, part seven, I and mean, we're going, yeah, the, we've probably been in indwelling life for like, who knows, 37 weeks, who knows, I don't even count it, but this is Renewing the Mind, part seven, um, and just want to start off again with the scripture we've been looking at that's so important is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse three through six, where Paul said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful, very important. The weapons God has given are divinely powerful. The weapons God has given to destroy strongholds are divinely powerful. They're anointed. They have power in them to destroy thinking patterns that are raised up against the knowledge of God. He continues, he says, these weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. These are big you know, in, in Paul's day, in the day of when it, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, there were these big, massive, thick walls, 15 feet thick, 20 feet high, that chariots could ride upon. I mean, they were massive structures that kept the city insulated, but actually, and Paul's saying that, yes, that's good for this city, but when I'm applying it to you, it's actually the, these walls are actually keeping God and others out based on thinking patterns that you have developed. And, I, and Paul was basically saying, I am here to destroy these thinking patterns so God can be released to come into you. Because when, when, these, when we have walls built up, it actually keeps God out. And when we, have a wall, when we have a root of rejection, it hinders the indwelling life of Jesus Christ from flowing out of us. My personal opinion is, one of the greatest strongholds that's keeping the bride of Christ from being made ready is the stronghold of rejection. And that the only way the bride is going to be, ready, be made ready is for that stronghold of rejection to be broken down so the bride can be made ready. <clears throat> so this is very important, very important. Paul said, we are destroying speculations. We are destroying reasoning. We are destroying every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So this is being taken captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. God is looking for complete obedience. And when we have strongholds in our minds that are not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, what happens is our obedience is not complete and we're not ready. And so but Paul is gripped and burdened by this that, that made the church of Jesus Christ come to complete obedience, complete readiness. And so we've already talked about the stronghold of unworthiness. Last week I talked about the stronghold of rejection. We're going to talk, we're going to continue talking about the stronghold of rejection. I could tell last week, like people's eyes were opened and they were like, wow, okay, that explains the reason, the way I am. You know, it's like, wow, I had no idea the things that I did were actually the fruit of rejection. And it's really super helpful when we begin to realize, oh my goodness, I am doing this right now because of rejection. I am cynical right now because of rejection, or I'm bitter because of rejection, or I'm not, I have distrust because of rejection, or I've, I'm rebelling against something because of rejection. And when you begin to see that fruit, it helps you to realize what you know, what I've become, what I'm doing, the way I'm reacting, my coping mechanisms, my defense mechanisms that I'm raising up. So, you know, once you see that, you realize, oh, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So you can realize I need to be planted deeper in the love of God. And so 
there are two soils that you, one of a, you're going to be planted in either one of two soils, and a lot of times you might have root systems in one, in, in both soils at the same time. God's goal is to plant you in the soil of his love with no root systems whatsoever in the soil of rejection. And if, if we have most of our root system planted in the soil of God's love, but we have just a little bit, 15, 25% in the soil of rejection, we're going to have mixed fruit. If all of us, if all of our root system is planted in rejection, then we're just going to manifest the rotten fruit of rejection, which we talked about last week. So rejection, what, what soil are you rooted and grounded in? Because that was the burden of Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. He wanted the Ephesians, he wanted us to be rooted and grounded in God's love in Jesus Christ. That is where we produce the fruit of the Spirit. If, you're, if your root system is rooted and grounded in rejection, you can't produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit only comes out when your root system is grounded in the love of God. And if it's not rooted and grounded in the love of God, you're going to produce the fruit of rejection. Every single, every single uh, rejection comes as a very small seed. And in fact, I'm going to share my testimony again just to remind you. And I've got pictures this time because some of you are like, who's Dolph Lundgren and Opie and, uh, you know, Tom Petty? And I've got pictures to show you. Uh, but we'll get there in a minute. But it's amazing that one wound of rejection, one thing of rejection can plant a seed inside of you. And that seed of rejection can begin to grow up into this tree that produces the rotten fruit of rejection, and you don't even realize it. You don't even realize it. I, I go, and I'll share in a minute, but just that one word that someone said to me back when I was a sophomore, 15 in high school, just wounded me so deeply that it, it sent me into this tailspin of rejection. <clears throat> so trees have roots, and, root, and roots determine fruit. So just remember that. Trees have roots, and roots determine fruits. <clears throat> Whatever fruit you're producing in your outward life is coming from a root that is inside of you internally. So if you're producing rotten fruit, it means you have a bad root. If you're producing good fruit, it means you have a good root. Your soil is, your, your tree is in good soil. And so let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3 here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, is, and, and this is a prayer, and I would encourage you to make this one of your most important prayers you pray regularly, if not daily, because it's vital. This is vital. This is not something that happens one time in a prayer line. This is, this, this is a lifetime, because our root systems are so grounded in the, root, in the soil of rejection. And all the rejection that we've experienced, because rejected people reject people. And that's been going on for 6,000 years of human history. Rejected people reject people. So that's just what our, our current world system is like right now. Rejected people rejected people. So if you're in that soil, and most everyone is, until we're transplanted by the love of God, we're going to produce the rotten fruit of rejection. And so Paul said that you being rooted and grounded in love, just, just take note of that right there, that you being rooted and grounded in love. He, he's talking about here a tree. He's using the metaphor of a tree, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that your root system would go down very deep into the soil of God's love that you would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Again, this is what Paul's talking about here. This is what makes us so complicated for me as a preacher, is this can, I cannot get up here and explain to you with five points in a five-point sermon, this is the love of God, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. You can't get this by just the receiving of knowledge because what Paul's saying here is this goes beyond knowledge. 
And so what he's really getting at is that you must experience God's love. You must experience God's love. What Paul's saying here is to pray that you might regularly, on a daily basis or on a regular basis, experience the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, expressed to you personally, not just by, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, not just by reading it in Scripture, but you experiencing it in your emotions, you experiencing it in your mind, in your thinking patterns, you experiencing the love of God. And when you experience the love of God, slowly what happens is your root systems in the soil of rejection begin to be transplanted into the soil of God's love. And as that happens, you will begin to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you're still rooted in rejection, and we talked about this, um, we're going to go into more detail about this today, a lot more detail, is if you're still rooted in rejection, you're going to produce the fruit of low self-esteem, inferiority, insecurity, rebellion, independence, judgmentalism, anger, control, bitterness, escapism, distrust, jealousy, fear, hopelessness, depression, defensiveness, hardness, cynicism, competition, perfectionism, withdrawal, and isolation. That's basically everything. I don't know if there's anything else you could say. Every single bad fruit, I'm convinced, comes out of the wounds, the wounds of rejection that we have not experienced healing from. <clears throat> See, because God created us, God created us to love God, or God created us to be loved by God, to love God and to love others. And when we are, when we, that's the way God designed us. And when we don't, when that failure happens, then we have many different reactions and responses when that need is not met. And, and 1 John 4, 19 says that we love because he first loved us. We love God not because we grit our teeth and try with our own willpower to love God. We love God because we have known and experienced and believed his love, and that love we've received from God overflows back to God, and we love him, and then it overflows into others, and we love others. And when we don't experience that love, we begin to manifest the fruit of rejection. And everyone experiences it very differently. Now, I, I shared, and just let me say this, is most people, and I just remember when I learned about the root of rejection, I had no idea how much I was, who I was based on rejection. I had no idea until the light shined on it. I did not realize how much rejection had affected me, who I was, and the negative fruit it was producing. And so the purpose of this teaching is, to help describe how rejection affects you, to shine light on it to into that fruit of rejection so you can overcome rejection, the rejection you've experienced in the past, the rejection you will experience in the future. Everyone is going to experience rejection in the future so that you can go, uh, let there be light. <laughs> so you can go and, and experience healing and deliverance and victory over the root of rejection. And so I just remember, I, I told my story last, sun, last Sunday, but I'll share it just again, just, and I've got another story I want to share. But I remember when I was, I was 15, I was a sophomore in high school, and Rocky III had come out in 1982. I don't remember exactly when I watched it, but I remember me and my friends, we went to see that. It was me and uh, John Barnett and Drew Anthony, and we went to go see that, that movie. And I'm sure you remember. And we, we came back, and we all got boxing gloves and football helmets, and we went outside and started having boxing matches with each other. I don't even know how old, 12 years old maybe, but I, I remember that this, this Russian guy, Dolph Lundgren, Dolph Lundgren, Grin, Dolph Lundgren, uh, I remember just... As a sophomore in high school, I was like, man, I want to be like that guy. And I, I got a picture here. You can show it. <clears throat> the Russian dude. That's how I wanted to be. 
Um, I was very, very, very far from that, but I wanted to be that guy. I remember me and, my, me and my best friend in high school, we were working out probably as a freshman or sophomore in my basement. I still remember this. I don't have a great memory. I remember football, food, and scripture, but not much else. But I remember this is we were talking, working out, and he was like, yeah, I could be Rocky and you could be Dolph Lundgren. And, you know, we were trying to, like, be this. And as a sophomore in high school, <clears throat> that's how I wanted to be. And then... Um, I remember exactly where I was as a sophomore in high school in the lunchroom when this guy told me, so to show the next picture, Opie, he said, hey, Opie. You know, so I wanted to be Dolph Lundgren and someone called me Opie. And I remember this, it sounds, it really sounds so stupid, doesn't it? I mean, it's like so stupid, but it was, it was so real. I'm telling you, it was so real. And I'm saying this to help you because all of us have wounds of rejection. That wound of rejection crushed me. <laughs> That wound of rejection crushed me. It was like, I wanted to be Dolph, and I was Opie. <clears throat> and it, it, I just remember that. It, it, probably that sent me into that not dealing with that. It was, I just remember the, I still remember that feeling I had after he told, called me Opie. And I think my face turned like bright red, if not purple. I was so embarrassed by that. And I just remember it, it just sent me in all the different rebellion that I went to, the, the fruit of rejection, rebellion, anger, um, you know, getting into the party scene, all those different things began to manifest in my life because of this rejection, even self-rejection, and I didn't know any of that until the Lord began to show me, this is the fruit of rejection. I, I told you last week about how as a, as a senior in high school, you, you can show the biggest ego award I won, that's what I, you can see that. <clears throat> A lot of you have seen that. Some of you haven't. But I won the biggest ego award as a uh, senior in high school. But I really, in all honesty, I wasn't, I wasn't really proud like that. I was more very, very insecure um, because I wanted to project this certain image and I had self-rejection and all these things. But I remember it was, it was really funny. Um, my best friend was like really ripped and he looked like, kind of like Dolph Lundgren and I didn't. And so I was trying to compete with him and he was on this like super intense protein diet. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go on that too. Just because I was trying to compete with him to beat him because I wanted to be what he looked like. And I remember I, I got down to such a low percentage of body fat that I looked like Tom Petty. You can show the next slide there. I looked like Tom Petty. <laughs> That's what I looked like in high school. Like my senior year in high school, I lost so much weight. My face was shrunk in. And anyway, that's, so what I'm speaking about rejection, everyone, every single person responds differently. So you're not going to hopefully respond quirky like I did. But I mean, looking back at that's hilarious. Why, why, why did I respond that way? It's just, just, just really crazy. But everyone is going to respond differently. I, I was listening to a podcast this, uh, this week, I listened to it twice. It was a podcast by uh, John Christ. You know John Christ, the Christian comedian, was being interviewed. He's hilarious. Uh, you know, he had, um, he was, he was, he had, did some, some things wrong. I won't go into all the details he did wrong. He's since been restored. But just listening to him uh, being interviewed, and it was really eye-opening to me when he was talking because he said this. He said, I was a, I was one of eight children. And, you know, even though my parents showed me love, the way, I, the way I interpreted it, I didn't interpret them as showing me love. And basically, basically what he was saying is I didn't get the attention that I needed or thought I needed as a kid. And it put in a wound of rejection in me. And he was saying that even he, he, he just kind of like I shared about the Opie story, he shared he, this one story he shared when he was playing tennis and his parents were like 30 minutes late one time, and all the other parents had come to pick up their kids and all these things, and he was, he was waiting for 30 minutes with the coach, and he's like, it communicated to me they didn't care. And that one thing put in him a, a wound of rejection in him, and he began to compensate for that wound by being, you know, he's naturally funny, but by being funny. And so through that, he was, he was trying to get the approval and the affirmation that he needed from that sense of withheld love. And so he said when he was in this addiction, uh, when he was in treatment, he said, I didn't struggle with alcohol addiction. I didn't struggle with, like, you know, 
girls or anything like that. He said, what I struggled with was the dopamine rush that came from likes and, and, and my videos going viral because it was trying to meet this need in me for affirmation, for love, and for acceptance. Like, oh my gosh. And, he, and, and just listen to him. He said, he said that um, w- one of the things that, that he became famous for was, was making fun of the church. And he said, I had so much hate for the church. Now, he didn't say this, but this is what I'm reading between the lines, is he may have possibly looked at the church as taking away the time that he could have received from his father. Like the church, in other words, his father was showing more attention to the church than he was to him. And so it gave him this hatred of the church that came out in mocking uh, as comedy. And, you know, it's a very interesting thing, but just, it just made me realize, man, every single person, you know, just is struggling with rejection. And the, the key to this is God's love. The key to this is God's love. And knowing, knowing the way rejection works, knowing the way, you know, just knowing the way that these mechanisms work. We have, the, our soul has these has, has these mecha coping mechanisms and defense mechanisms and reactions that all of us have. Our soul has these things that will respond when love is withheld. And so let's just walk through some of these here. Is the first one, rebellion, is a lot of times when, this is the case for me, I, I went into rebellion because of a wound of rejection. And a lot of people are in rebellion, because, I, would, I don't want to say most, maybe most, a significant number of people go into rebellion because of a wound of rejection that hasn't been healed. Because, you know, we all have this need to belong. We all have this need to be accepted. And when someone experiences that rejection, what they're seeking in the way, the way they respond to that withheld affection, that withheld approval is by rebelling against authority or rebelling against what's socially accepted or whatever. And it, they're trying to create a new sense of belonging. You know, whether, they, whether it's challenging authority or alternate, alternate lifestyle, what people are doing in rebelling is because they're trying to bolster their self-esteem and their self-worth. That makes sense? And, and you can see this. You can see this rebellion festering and growing. Um, you, know, just, you know, just a couple of examples. Teenagers, when they are experiment with drugs and alcohol, or break rules, or whatever. They are responding to a hurt that was never healed by rebellion by trying to be trying to fit in. The LGBTQ plus movement is a great example. The rejection they have experienced, that 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 uh, that movement of trying to push this agenda into society is driven by rejection. Is driven that rebellion is driven by rejection. The terrorist, ISIS, the Islamic terrorist. Hamas, Hezbollah, and ISIS is driven by rejection. In fact, if you think about this, the ultimate wound of rejection came through Abraham and Ishmael. Because if you think about this, if you go back into the whole thing with Abraham and Ishmael, Abraham received the promise of God's word, I am going to establish my covenant with you and your seed. Now, he was barren, and they were getting old. And so Abraham had this brilliant idea. I'm going to go into Hagar, and I'm going to have a a son through Hagar, and Ishmael was born. Now, listen, for many years, we don't know how many years exactly, but for many years, Abraham thought Ishmael was the heir of the covenant. I don't know how long it was. If I could go back, it might even show me. I haven't researched this. But it shocked Abraham one day when God said, I am going to give you a son. Basically saying, Ishmael, I will bless Ishmael, but he's not the son through whom the covenant will come through. And so it got to this point where, you know, Abraham had to send Ishmael away because Ishmael was rejected because he thought he was the heir. I mean, for for years, Ishmael was hearing, you're the son of the covenant and you're the one through whom these promises are going to come through. And all of a sudden, Abraham has to go back and say, well, on second thought, you know, God had encountered me. I had this vision. And on second thought, you're actually not. Isaac is. I mean, you, you don't even think about the wounds of rejection that Ishmael experienced. But he had to be, because of that, he began to have animosity and he began to have contention with Isaac. And finally, 
I, Abraham had to drive Ishmael out. And God said, even though he drives him out, I'm going to bless them. And so, so much of what we're seeing manifested today through Islamic terrorism is rooted, in fact, in the root of rejection. It's crazy how that works. That rebellion that, that is festering up is rooted in rejection. An another fruit of rejection is independence. Now, when I say independence, I just I want to clarify this. I, there is some good independence Okay, because we don't need to be codependent on other people, but there's some, there's some good independence. But what I'm talking about is the independence that causes you not to be able to receive from the Lord and causes you not to be able to receive from others that makes you unteachable so that you can't receive from the body of Christ or you can't receive from others. That, that form of independence is what I'm talking about. Um, because when, what happens is when you experience rejection... What you do is you form, uh, you want to try to then protect yourself so that I don't have to experience the pain of rejection that I just experienced. You begin to form this self-protection. And that self-protection, you just begin to say, now I don't need to rely on these people anymore. They let me down. I don't need to rely on this person anymore. They let me down. And you can even boil over into your relationship with the Lord I don't need God's help. I mean, you may not even say this, but you can almost form such an independence. I don't need God's help because they let me down. I am going to do it myself. If it's going to get done, it's going to get done by me. And so that self-protection leads to a self-reliance where you say, I am going to do it. Now, it, and, and that serves then as this thing where I'm, I'm not going to be relying on anyone else because I can do it myself and you think about, I, I saw a study recently, or heard a study recently, that, that, that many of today's most successful entrepreneurs were severely rejected. And that rejection created this motivation in them that I want to be the absolute best I can be. I want to be the best entrepreneur. I want to be the best athlete. I want to be the, most, the smartest. I want to be the most successful. I want to have the most money. And what they're, what they're doing really is they're being driven because they, not everyone, but many are, because they know if I'm successful, people can't reject me like they did. Uh, you know, just, just so many things, entrepreneurs, academic success, artists, athletes, all, you know, so many are driven by, by rejection. I'm going to be the best I can be. Now, they're, listen. We should try to be the best we can be. We should strive for excellence. We should try, and anything we do, we want, to, we want to do the absolute best we can do. But we always want to check our motives. Am I doing this because I was rejected by this person? Am I doing this, is my fuel being, is motivating me because I'm motivated because I was rejected and I'm showing them I can do this? Or are we doing it because we want to do, be excellent and do the best thing, we, best job we can do as unto the Lord? You see the difference there? Both of them are, you know, I, I, I definitely say go for it, be the best you can be, whatever you do. Just make sure the motivation is not being driven by rejection. Make sense? Anger. Anytime we've been, anytime we have experienced rejection, because of the pain associated with it, is we have anger. I mean, it's, a, it's the natural response because what happens is when you, when you are rejected, it is a blow against your self-esteem, your self-worth, and your identity. You basically say, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not attractive enough, or whatever, and it creates this anger inside of you that, and that anger, what it does is a coping mechanism that can help you handle the pain and the hurt that you have experienced. You know, it, it, it's a... Uh, it, it's one way, when you, when you struggle with anger, it's a coping mechanism, and it's also um, a more acceptable way to express to someone, you, you see, a lot of this happens so quickly, you don't even realize it. It's, it's, a, it's a more acceptable way to show someone I'm hurting without saying I'm hurting. That makes sense? Because if you cry and you go, that hurt my feelings, you look weak, and when you get rejected, you lose control, you lose a sense of control, and so... Anger is this, this kind of strong, intense response that you show, I'm still in control, I still have self-worth, and I'm demonstrating through my anger. 
and how powerful I am. Does that make sense? So much anger, if, 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 people have a, if people have a struggle with anger, if you, if you are watching and you're listening or you're here and listening and I, I've just have struggled with anger my whole life and I can't get victory over anger, most likely it's because you have a root of rejection. And that anger will continue to manifest no matter how much you don't want it to until you experience God's love and God's healing from the rejection you have experienced. So the best advice I can give you is don't just try to uh, handle the fruit of anger, like go to anger management classes. I'm not saying don't go to anger management classes, but, but if, if that root is still there, that root of rejection is still there, you're going to manifest the fruit of anger whether you like it or not, because your soil, your, your roots are in the soil of rejection. And so if you want victory over anger, it comes by experiencing what I just said in Ephesians chapter 3, experiencing God's love. Anger is also a coping mechanism because you're trying to cope with the pain you have experienced. And so you think, okay, because of this pain that I've experienced, it, by, by releasing my anger, it temporarily alleviates the pain I just experienced from the rejection. And so, again, it, it can be a coping mechanism. Anger can be a defense mechanism where you've experienced rejection and you get angry because what you do when you get angry, what happens is you put up a wall against anyone that has rejected you so they can't reject you again. In other words, you put up the anger to say, I'm going to get, I'm, my anger is a defense mechanism so that you can't reject me again. And in other words, it's, it's protecting you, yes, from further rejection, but it's keeping you isolated through your anger from others getting close. See, when you experience rejection, you lose control of the situation. And so what anger can make you feel like, you're now gaining back control. You're now gaining back control. And it also helps you protect your self-esteem to say, okay, I, my self-esteem was wounded by this rejection, but now I'm, I'm demonstrating or manifesting anger as a, form, as a defense mechanism to protect my self-esteem. So, you know, just there's many different examples. A father who rejected their son, and now the son's grown up and as a father is now enraged by their son, and he's, he, gets, he blows up any time the son does something wrong. Well, what happened is a lot of that is rooted in rejection because the, the son was rejected by the father, and now the father, who now has a son, is now doing the very same thing to his son that he learned because He's rooted in rejection. That anger is flying off uh, out of him, manifesting out of him. I mean, I used to have, a, a, because of my root of rejection, I used to have a big stronghold of uh, anger. I used to be so angry. I remember, my parents will love this story, but I remember, I can just remember this. <clears throat> I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I used to just really be angry. And uh, one day I didn't have the key to the house and I couldn't get in. I was so angry and I... <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but I, uh, I got a baseball bat and just like took the, I took the baseball bat and smashed the glass in our back porch and my dad came home. <laughs> Man, you were mad. <laughs> you were mad. But I, I really, I had, a, I had a really, a real problem with anger. I remember I used to play basketball and I would, every, I, was, I was very disciplined. I was a freshman in high school or, or maybe a sophomore in high school. I can't remember exactly what it was. I think it was a sophomore in high school. And um, that summer I was playing basketball outside. And if I didn't make like 90% of my shots, I would just take the ball and just go, ah, boom, and throw it against the wall and start cursing. And I mean, I, I just had a, a real problem with anger because of rejection, because of rejection. And so if you struggle with anger, if you struggle with anger, most likely it's because there's some root of rejection. And even parents, just to say this, as you're listening, yeah, you, you might have some of these, this fruit, but also look at your kids and go, okay, are, are my kids showing some of the fruit of rejection? And if they are, make sure 
that you understand, okay, they're responding this way not because of this, this, or that. They're responding this way because underlying there's a, reje- there's a wound of rejection. They need God's love. They need to know God's love and be rooted and grounded in God's love. Okay, hopefully this is making sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's like so eye-opening, isn't it, that, man, the way, the re- the way I am right now is because of rejection. You know, just to see that my whole life, you know, my whole life I've been living this way, I've been responding this way because I didn't experience and know the love of God. I didn't have that intimacy with Christ that cures and heals the wounds of rejection. The next one, bitterness. As Hebrews 12, 15 warns us, it says, see to it, that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. So when we experience rejection, if that rejection is not healed and it's deep and it's prolonged, what can happen is we can begin to get, to get bitter. We get bitter about the situation. It's like, I don't know if you've ever heard that, that saying that, it, you know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the person that hurts you would die. And that, that's really what bitterness does. It's suicidal. It does nothing. Bitterness does nothing. I mean, it's like drinking poison, hoping that the person who hurts you dies. That you think, okay, I am just constantly revolving this issue, this wound, this thing this person did to me. I'm constantly revolving this in my mind over and over and over, and, that, and that, that hurt, that pain is going over and over and over, and you think by your bitterness, you're taking vengeance on the person when it's actually destroying you. It, you know, just as that pain lingers, that pain is not healed, it, it actually hurts you, and then it defiles other people. Especially if the pain's lingering, and especially if the pain's deep. If the pain is lingering and the pain's deep, if if you've experienced deep, deep wounds of rejection, and those wounds of rejection have been deep, and they've been prolonged, and you haven't been healed, or, you know, you haven't had resolution there, is likely bitterness is beginning to spring up. And the thing is, is a lot of times you don't even know you're bitter, but everyone else knows you're bitter. I mean, it's, it's like bitterness amidst this odor that everyone around you knows, you know, I can smell your bitterness. I can smell your bitterness, but, you know, you can't smell it. All it is, everyone around you knows you, you, you got this bitter odor that's, that's coming out of you, and it's defiling other people. It's defiling your relationships. It's defiling your friends, your family, your, your kids. See, when, with rejection, a lot of times with rejection is we, every one of us do, do this, but we have expectations. And these expectations are if, if you don't do one, two, and three, if you don't do one, two, and three, then you have rejected me. You didn't meet my expectations, one, two, and three, that I had that says you got to meet one, two, and three for you, for me to feel accepted by you. And when you don't meet one, two, and three, you haven't met my expectations. And over time, if we're not careful, that, that unforgiveness can grow and grow and grow until we become bitter, bitter about the situation, bitter about the person, bitter about what they did. And that's why, that's why forgiveness is so crucial because in Matthew 18, the Lord said, if you don't forgive others, if you don't forgive others, my heavenly Father will not forgive you. Is that if, if we, as, as hard as it is, this, is, this should put some fear of the Lord in us, that as hard as it is to experience rejection, that if we have been wounded and, and we have not forgiven, then God himself th- does not forgive us. That's like, oh, wow, that's scary stuff. We want to walk in in forgiveness. See, not only can you be bitter at others, but you can also be bitter at the Lord. 
If you think, if you had these expectations that, okay, God needs to do A, B, and C in my life on this timetable, and then God doesn't do it the way I thought he should have done it, like whatever, whatever my timetable was, you, can, you become bitter at the Lord for his delayed answers when God's preparing you for something greater you can't see. And so when, when we come into the fire of delayed answers, when God's promise and his fulfillment are delayed, we can become bitter. Lord, why didn't you provide when I thought you would? Why didn't you answer this prayer when I thought you would? And, we, and without realizing it, we can become bitter and mad at the Lord and offended at the Lord. And it's very dangerous if we are offended at the Lord. It's very dangerous if we're offended at the Lord. See, bitterness, bitterness like anger can actually be a coping mechanism of pain. Where you find temporary relief from the pain you've experienced through your bitterness. It's kind of an odd thing. It's weird, but it really, you, you think that in my bitterness and in my, my, venge, my vengefulness, and I'm, I'm taking revenge in my mind, you, in that you, you, you're experiencing some temporary relief from the pain that was caused by you when it's actually destroying you and destroying those around you. It could be a coping mechanism that gives you a sense of power and control. Is this making sense? <laughs> okay. If I haven't gotten you yet, and this one will, this one will get you. Insecurity and inferiority. This was the big one for me. This is, a, this is the one that I, I really, really uh, struggled with, uh, especially in high school and then, you know, into college. Um, probably my late 20s began to get victory over this. But insecurity and inferiority... I don't really, I don't really struggle with this anymore. In fact, I like to be weird to Anna just to just to annoy her. But I need, I need probably help and deliverance from that. But uh, insecurity and inferiority is when you are rejected. What happens is it is a threat to your self worth, because what happens is you experience rejection and you begin to think, okay, I am not lovable, I am not valuable, I don't have any worth. And you begin to think, okay, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not attractive enough, I'm not funny enough, I'm not, I'm not a good communicator, I don't, I'm bad at this, I'm bad at that. And this can lead you to a feeling of inadequacy and inferiority. And what you begin to do is you begin to have comparisons, okay? You begin to compare and you begin to say, okay, well, I was rejected for this Therefore, I'm going to start comparing myself with these people who don't have the same inadequacies that I have, and it creates this whole, this whole system of comparison, especially with social media. I, mean, I can't even imagine where I would have, the struggle I would have had if I would have had social media back then because, man, that, that is like the fuel of comparison. And again, social media is an illusion. Instagram is an illusion. No one's that happy. No one's that blessed. I say that all the time just to remind you. No one's life is nearly that good. It's all a facade for the most part. Uh, sorry, I'm sounding a little cynical. But, you know, it, it, don't compare yourself to someone on social media. Um, but So what happens is rejection can trigger this comparison where you think, okay, I was rejected because I was called Opie. Therefore, I'm going to look at these people who are not Opie-ish. I don't know if that's a word. But, and I start comparing myself, okay, well, he's tan and he's got bleached blonde hair and he's got this stuff. I'm going to start doing this for me. And it creates this, this lack or this perception in you of what's lacking and it creates jealousy and envy. That out then leads to self-criticism. And I had this big time. I was such a harsh critic on myself. If I didn't get 90% of my shots right, I would be so mad. If I didn't... I don't know, if I didn't look a certain way, I would just judge myself so harshly. So when you, if you are struggling with self-criticism, likely it's, it's, there's a rooter rejection there where you are rejecting yourself for your inadequacies. Negative self-talk, self-criticism, harsh self-judgment, uh, con constantly reminding yourself of your perceived uh, shortcomings or flaws. That was me. <laughs> that was me. I was so... 
I was such a perfectionist about myself because it was, it was me trying to protect myself from an image I thought I needed so I wouldn't be rejected. <clears throat> and then that leads to a loss of confidence. And you feel like, okay, man, <clears throat> you know, I can't do anything right. I can't ever meet this lofty bar that I've, I've put up for myself. I'm never going to, you know, be able to do it. I, you know, I'm always going to fall short. I'm always a failure. And you lose confidence in whatever you, it is you're doing, whether it's school, whether it's um, athletics, whether it's education or uh, ministry or job or anything. And it then creates this self-doubt in you that you think and this insecurity that, okay, I am unworthy. I am unable. I have no value. I will never, I, I struggle with this or I struggle with that. And you begin to just doubt yourself. And then you begin to internalize that rejection for whatever it was you were rejected by. You begin to internalize it. And whatever it was you were rejected by, you begin to develop this inferiority or this inadequacy for. And it, it, then, it, it, then it, eventually it impacts your identity and who you are as a person, which our identity and our value as people, as Christians, must come in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is our identity. Our identity is in the fact that God loves me, the God of the universe, God who is love, God loves me, and I love God. And I'm telling you, it might sound so basic, but if you've ever experienced the love of God, there's no greater experience in life than the love of God. I'm telling you, if you say, well, I don't believe that, well, I'm just going to say you've never experienced it. And when you've experienced God's love, I've been out there, I've tried almost everything you can try, and I'm going to tell you, nothing compares to experiencing the love of God. When you experience that his love communicated to you by the Holy Spirit that goes beyond knowledge and you realize God loves me just the way I am, and you feel it, and you experience it. It goes into your emotions. It goes into your thinking. You begin to realize nothing else in this life matters. It ruins you. I mean, it almost is like if you have too much of God's love, you almost can't even function because it just ruins you. I remember like when back in the, the, the late, uh, the mid-90s when God was revealing his love to me and all this, I was just like weeping and crying all the time, and God was healing me of rejection. And I was just like, man. And I would go to my friends, Jesus loves me. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's good, Brian. Tears running down my eyes, Jesus loves me. And I look foolish, but I'm telling you, it was something that nothing, it was something that I had never experienced before, the love, the, the love of God expressed by the Holy Spirit. And it's hard to even explain. You have to experience his love. That's what I'm saying if you, if you struggle with any of this, your answer is not trying to create defense mechanisms or coping strategies. Your answer is get a greater experience of God's love. That's your answer. That sounds so simple. Well, it sounds simple because you may not have ever experienced God's love. Because when you experience his love and his love washes over you and his affection washes over you, and you realize you are the beloved and chosen of God, nothing else matters. I am in love with God. God's in love with me. Nothing else matters. That settles it. That nothing else even comes close. See, when you, when you, have, when you struggle with inferiority or insecurity, what happens is you begin to crave affirmation. Hey, you know, great, great message, Brian. I really loved, I mean, I'm not, don't, I'm not saying this, so you never tell me I do good, but I'm saying, I'm just kidding. But you start craving affirmation. Man, you did awesome on, your game was awesome. You had 15, 20 points. Or, you know, that, that, that message you did really was incredible. You start craving this affirmation. You start saying, man, your worship leading was awesome today. God really moved, whatever. And you start craving this affirmation where you want to be constantly praised. And it creates this addiction. That's what John Christ was, was describing, the comedian. He craved this constant affirmation because he was trying to meet something in him that was missing, which was God's love, experiencing God's love. And once you have the experience of God's love and you realize at the end of the day, the only one whose praise that really matters, this is easier said than done, 
The only one whose praise that really matters is what the Lord says to you. Well done and good and faithful servant. What the Lord says to you at the judgment seat of Christ, and the praise comes from him and not from others. But when you have that root of rejection, you're constantly uh, struggling. You're constantly trying to get that affirmation so you can feel better about yourself. And we'll end with this one, escapism. So have we gotten you yet? <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, man. <laughs> I didn't know I was in such a mess until you started saying all this stuff to me. <laughs> everyone, I guarantee you, every one of us has several, if not more, <laughs> several, if not all of these. Escapism. See, when, when you've been rejected, escapism serves as a coping mechanism. And escapism can be, man, can be experienced through alcohol. Most alcoholics or drug users are trying to use alcohol and drugs to heal the pain of rejection. If, if someone struggles with alcoholism or drugs, it's because they have experienced rejection. Most likely. I'm not saying in every case. Most likely, there's wound, deep, deep wounds of rejection. They're trying to, and they're trying to use alcohol and they're trying to use drugs to alleviate the pain. And, even, and even, even pornography, pornography also, because of the dopamine rush it gives you, that also can be a, a coping mechanism. If you struggle with that, it can also be a coping mechanism that you are using to try to heal the wounds of rejection. See, so video games, watching TV, um, shopping. No, not, not really shopping. Maybe shopping. Not college football. <clears throat> We use these, 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 these coping mechanisms to try to numb the pain that we have experienced. We Overeating, alcohol, drugs, pornography, these things become these addictions, and, and a lot of addictions are really rooted in rejection. And we're trying to use these things to numb and heal the pain that we've experienced by rejection. Trying to avoid reality, trying to say, okay, well, if I can escape reality, through video games, or I can escape reality through alcohol, or I can escape reality through drugs, I don't have to face or, or look into the eyes of rejection and say, this rejected me and go for what will heal you, which is the love of God in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to just escape from that so I don't have to face reality. Self-preservation as well is when we've experienced rejection, we want to escape from reality to preserve ourselves so we don't experience rejection. There, there's a, I mean, most of us form these, these walls of, of self-preservation to say, okay, you rejected me once, you rejected me twice, you're not going to do it again, and, and you escape reality through, through different things. And so, anyway, I, 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 um, there's, there's more, so we're, we'll, but I think that's good for today. <laughs> yeah, shoo, okay. Yeah, it's like I can't handle more than that. You've basically like uncovered me and said, showed me everything wrong with me. But I, I do want to just say, just to come back to this, let's, let's go back again to uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And, and I'm, I'm going to preach a message about this um, in a few weeks or maybe a month or so, depending on when. But for me, what... The greatest thing that healed me of rejection, that sounds so weird, was the Song of Solomon. <laughs> the Song of Solomon, I remember in the mid-90s, and God was telling me, you have a root of rejection. I didn't even know it. And I remember that time, Mike Bickle began to teach on the Song of Solomon. And, you know, the, that's the last thing I would have thought. Okay, the Song of Solomon, your hair is like a flock of goats and your teeth are like needly shorn ewes and, you know, it's like your, your, na your belly button is like a goblet of wine. I mean, like, how in the world does that really, like, heal you of rejection? I'm like, that's so weird. It's, you know, you're, like, raisin cakes and all this stuff. And, but, I, t I mean, I tell you, that teaching Mike Bickle did in the mid-'90s, he's even got it online, you can check it out, I highly recommend it, is listening to that just was like, oh, my gosh. God's love for me as his bride broke me down. I 
and my beloved's and his desire is for me. And, and just knowing that, his love, that in the, no, no matter what you've been through, the bridegroom God is pursuing you to have a relationship with you. He's pursuing you, and, and even he's saying, you're dark but lovely. I see, yes, I see the scars in your life. I see the abuse you've encountered. I see those things that have happened to you. I see those things, and I want you to know that you are lovely to me. You're dark. I see the darkness, but you're lovely to me. You're beautiful to me. And when you begin to feel that love come to you in an experience like like uh, through the Song of Solomon, the bridegroom God communicating his love for you, it is life-changing. In fact, when Jesus said in, in uh, Revelation chapter 3, he said, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door to, to me, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I heard this guy talk about this just a couple weeks ago, and I, I've never heard it before, but I believe, believe he was absolutely correct is he was saying when Jesus quoted, or when Jesus said that in, in Revelation chapter 3, he was quoting Song of Solomon 5, where the, where the bridegroom was knocking on the door, and the bride said, a voice, my beloved, is knocking. And the coming in that the Lord was talking about was like in Song of Solomon 4 and 5, where the bride says, come into my garden Come into my garden and eat its choice fruit. And the Lord, and again, I'm applying, I'm applying this allegorically. The Lord comes in and says, I have come into your garden, my beloved, my bride. Is when, is when, the, when you experience intimacy with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, it heals the wounds of rejection. It heals the pain of rejection. When you experience the love of Jesus Christ and the love of God in an intimate relationship with him, and again, don't envision this, especially guys, don't envision this as a Jewish man with a beard giving you a kiss on the lips, okay? There, there's nothing appealing about that. We're not talking about in the physical. There's, this has nothing to do with sex. This is completely spiritual. It's the Holy Spirit communicating the love of God to you to where you experience this spiritually and you experience this intimacy with the Lord, this deep communion connection and fellowship with the Lord, when you experience that, when you open the door to him and he comes in and you experience that deep affection, that deep relationship, him speaking to you and you hearing his voice, that is what heals you from rejection. And you realize that you are the Lord's beloved and he says to you, you are my beloved he says to you, you are my chosen. He says to you, even as the Father has loved me, I love you. And even as the Father, even as I love the Father, I love you. And, and the Lord's just saying to you, you are my beloved one. You are my chosen one. Come dwell in intimacy with me. And when you do, when you open up the door of your heart to him, and he comes in, into your garden, into the garden of your heart, and you experience that communion and that intimacy with him, you realize your love is better than wine. Your love is better than life. There is no greater pleasure in life than experiencing this intimate, loving relationship with God through the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ. Nothing compares. And when you, the more you are rooted and the more you are grounded in that, you begin to be transplanted from the soil of rejection and the terrible fruit it produces into the soil of God's love and the fruit of the Spirit it produces. And so I just want to pray as we end. I just want to pray for us just that the Lord would, would give us this revelation. Just open your hearts to him right now. I want to pray this for us. Just receive. Just, just to stand. Let's just stand here. And even online, just, just receive this prayer. Again, I have, I have zero power. <laughs> this has to be an, a work of God. But just receive and just, just agree with me. Lord, just say, if you want this, just say, Lord, do it. Lord, do it. Lord, I'm saying it for myself. Lord, do it in me. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, for everyone in person, everyone in online, 
Lord, to do a work that only you can do, that you would grant to us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power, or actually, verse 17, sorry. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, verse 18, no, verse 17, sorry. <laughs> that you, being rooted and grounded in love, I'm asking you, Father, for all of us, Lord, where we have been planted in the soil of rejection for many, many years, I'm praying, God, that we would be planted in the soil of your love. Lord, would you bring every one of us into that, that divine romance of the gospel? That divine romance is we are going to be married to you forever. Lord, would you, in Jesus' name, romance our hearts with your love? Lord, romance our hearts, tenderize our hearts with your love. Lord, that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Lord, that I pray that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. Lord, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Lord, just even, just even what the, the Song of Solomon says, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Lord, may the affection of the Lord, who is the bridegroom God, be communicated by the Spirit of the Lord to our heart in such a way that we feel the personal affection that Jesus Christ has for us as his bride. This is not some distant, ethereal thing. This is real. It's practical. Lord, let us feel the love of Jesus Christ in this relationship with you, Lord. I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I just when I was praying, I just had this thought, and my daughter's probably going to kill me, but <clears throat> there's this Gen Z saying that it's called, uh, you probably don't know this. I didn't know this called uh, W. Riz. Does anyone know what W. Riz means? Raise your hand if you know what W. Riz means. Just let me see if you, just raise your hand if you know what W. Riz means. Huh? Okay, I know there's more people. Probably anyone under 20 and under knows what W. Riz means. It means to, a Riz comes from charisma, and it means romantic charisma. And to W means to win, so you have romantic charisma to win the heart of the one you love. <laughs> hey, how's that for Gen Z lingo? You got to, I mean, they, they've developed this whole dictionary of Gen Z lingo. It's like, I don't even have a clue what they're talking about. But the Lord wants to win your heart and the, 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 with his love, that he wants to win your heart into this divine romance of the gospel, that he would bring your heart into this relationship with him where he woos you and draws you and reveals to you his personal affection. This is not about like, you know, women seem to have more of a drawing to this than men are like, oh, that seems weird. This is not about a Jewish man with a beard. This is about the love of God communicated by the Holy Spirit that, that he, you feel the love of God by the Spirit of God and your heart is filled and drawn by his love. And I'm going to teach on this in the Song of Solomon uh, just because it was so instrumental for me to get delivered from a root of rejection I believe it's a, it is a key, uh, is it, the Song of Solomon is a key for the bride to be delivered from the root of rejection to be made ready as a bride for him. And so just let the Lord W. Riz you, okay? When you, through his romance, through his drawing, wooing love into this personal affection, Larry, let the Lord W raise you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, but seriously, <clears throat> that the Lord would just reveal his love to you in this personal way that you would know the love of God. Amen. Amen. So we'll uh, end the online portion. I'm going to hear about it when I get home. She's, if, we made Anna watch.